There are a lot of difficulties, a lot of challenges. We'll talk about all of them in detail. You know, you sort of, people put words in your mouth and kind of get the reputation as this doom and gloom guy. You know, Jim Vickers is always talking about the end of the world, which I don't. I never talk, used to use that expression. But I make the point that, yeah, despite the difficulties, we don't have to be victims. We're not helpless. We don't have to curl up in a ball. It, the, the key is to see it coming. If you can see things coming, you can deal with them accordingly. You can get through them, not only preserve wealth, but actually make money. I always uh, point out the example of um, Ugo Stinnes, and people go, well, who's that? He was an industrialist in Weimar, Germany in the, the uh, early 1920s, and he could see the hyperinflation coming long before the middle class, long before anybody else. He went out and borrowed an enormous amount of Reichsmarks, so that, that was the currency at the time, and just bought industrial assets, coal mines, uh, vessels, uh, you know, natural resources, etc. So here comes the hyperinflation. He gives it a little time. He pays back his debts. I would say your pennies on the dollar, like a millionth of a penny on the dollar. In other words, uh, but he paid it back. They were sweeping the money down the sewers, but he paid back his debts and kept all the assets. And he became the richest man in Germany. And my German is not very good, but his nickname was the Inflationskönig, which means the inflation king. So there are other stories like it, Joseph Kennedy in the 1929 crash, but here's a guy who lived through the greatest hyperinflation of any modern industrial economy and ended up as the richest man in Germany because he saw it coming and made the right move. So again, we're not, uh, we're not helpless. We can do things about it. The key to empowerment, as I say, is to see it coming. That's where the analysis comes in. And you're like, gee, Jim, are you smarter than everybody else? Of course not. Uh, there are a lot of big brains around, but people have flawed models. They have a lot, there's a lot of, um, behavioral psychology behind it, you know, the you know, confirmation bias or believing the future will resemble the past, which it usually does not. And uh, so if you're going to stick to those models, yeah, you're going to get really bad results. It's hard to think of an institution that has a worse forecasting record than the Federal Reserve, or the U.S. Federal Reserve, with the possible exception of the IMF. They're both pretty bad. I mean, you could almost take the Fed forecast, do the opposite and, and be just fine. There's more to it than that, but they just stick to these really bad models. But if you understand how the economy really works, if you understand it's a complex dynamic system, all I've done is I've taken complexity theory, which has been around for a while. I mean, you can say 13 billion years because the Big Bang was uh, you know, the ultimate complex dynamic. Uh, but the science of complexity understood in mathematical terms really dates to the kind of the early 60s. But it's been used very successfully in physics. You know, I've been out at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, worked with the, the top people there. Um, it has a lot of applications. All I did was bring it over to capital markets. I looked at capital markets and said, wait a second, here's one of the most complex dynamic systems you can picture. And then there's nothing more complex than the human brain. So you're putting humans on top of capital markets. You've got complexity squared or some exponent. And those models work brilliantly. But try getting anyone to understand it or, or do that work is difficult. But, but again, the point is, if you have the right models, and I would include behavioral psychology, a good dose of history, complexity theory, and a few other branches of applied mathematics, you can get very good results. But if you stick to, you know, the Phillips curve and uh, non-accelerating inflation, unemployment rate, and a lot of other nonsense the Fed uses, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna get it wrong. I had a long career on Wall Street, you know, made a certain amount of money, came into long-term capital management uh, in 1994 before the launch. So it was, I was the, the only general counsel through the uh, collapse in 1998, but I was the lawyer. Now I'm not washing my hands of the risk management and all that. I, I work side by side with these guys. I mean, Myron, on a quiet day, Myron Scholes, who, you know, is a Nobel Prize winner in economics, co-inventor of the Black Scholes formula, which is the basis of one quadrillion dollars of notional value of derivatives in the world. By the way, for people not familiar with the Q word, one quadrillion is a thousand trillion. So that's how many derivatives, all balance sheet derivatives we have. But Myron, you know, invented that formula that set the base of all of it. You know, really nice guy. And I'd be sitting at my desk and he'd walk in, I had a whiteboard uh, and I would ask him some dumb question about the markets. And he would sit there and give me like a two hour tutorial. So can you imagine getting a private two hour tutorial from Nobel Prize winner? So yeah, I was, I was around when there weren't that many of us, but I was sort of the lawyer, very focused on that compliance, you know, contracts. Uh, I wrote the derivatives contract. So I was very immersed in all that, but I was kind of comfortable putting my money with the firm, including the money I'd made previously. You know, even the guys who didn't win the Nobel Prize at 160 IQs, they were the real deal. They were 
you know, one of them was the youngest professor, youngest full professor in the history of Harvard University and the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve. Two Nobel Prize winners, um, you know, J.M. John Merriweather was legendary on Wall Street. So that was the crowd. So I was at ease about the money, just very much focused on my job. And then when it all fell apart in 1998, I always say in the U.S. system, it's true in the U.K. also, when things really, really, really go bad, they hand it to the lawyer. So like, hey, well, I can't I can't deal with this. I give it to the lawyers. And so it could be a bankruptcy trustee. We did not go into bankruptcy. You know, a negotiator, bailout expert. You know, there are many, uh, m- many people specialize. So I got the whole thing handed to me and then we organized it and got through it. We did, we were able to foam the runways and, you know, with like four engines flaming, you know, kind of bring it in for a soft landing. We were hours away from closing every exchange in the world sequentially. We would have started in Tokyo. We got a term sheet on a Wednesday, five days. Nobody slept. I mean, nobody slept. You, the, you know, in, in big law firms, I, I was, I was working. We had a base at Skadden Arps. I was, um, my office was up in Greenwich, but. I was back and forth. And, you know, so the first day, everyone looks like a lawyer. Second day, the ties come off. You know, third day, the jackets come off and the shirts are unbuttoned down to the middle of the chest. No one's showered or bathed or whatever. And it just gets grubbier, but you sort of power through it and, and get it done. And we did on a, late on a Sunday night before Tokyo opened. But if it had fallen down and it came close, Tokyo Stock Exchange would have been closed. And then Singapore and, and you know, Paris and London and, and New York, they would have probably reopened a few days later, but it would have been a shock like nothing since, uh, since the Great Depression. So, but, but the problem is we did did get through it and uh, two things number one it was 24 years ago so people 25 years ago almost so people kind of fuzzing on it you know if you're under 40 it's probably like a footnote in some uh, economics book or whatever but uh, we were looked at by the sec and the cftc and you know there were no lawsuits uh and uh so we, we kind of got through it all i mean interestingly some of the principals after long-term capital you know you pick yourself up you dust yourself off they started new companies and made a billion dollars so they had the talent we just had uh, had a very uh very bad patch. But I sort of looked at it myself and said, well, wait a second. Uh, These people really were who they said they were. They really were that good. And yet they had this disastrous outcome, massive failure risk management. They're not dumb. They're not venal, but they must be doing something wrong. I don't mean in the moral legal sense. I mean, there must be something wrong in the model, in the uh, way they understood markets, or you wouldn't have ended up that way. So I sort of, I continued my career. I, I ran a stock exchange after that. I, uh, it was not long after 9-11. I was tapped by the CIA and, you know, did that for 10 years. But I never got over this. Well, wh- what were they missing? And so then I just kind of on my own time, in my own way, I started exploring what could be wrong with the models, what assumptions were, uh, you know, at odds with the facts. How did models actually, or sorry, how did markets actually work and what models did work? I started writing on that, lecturing on that. Um, And because of my national security work, I got tapped to go out to Los Alamos, Los Alamos National Laboratory. And that's like, good luck getting in. (laughs) That's that's, that's, that's harder to get in than any other place I've ever been. But sort of Mesa, working with people who were simulating nuclear explosions in a computer, supercomputer, because you can't blow things up anymore, but we still have to do the weapons development. I was meeting with them to collaborate on taking that branch of physics and complexity theory and bring it to capital markets. So what was interesting, I would say something, well, I did say this, I would say, you know, if we had uh, used what we call team science or interdisciplinary approaches, as if we had some physicists, applied mathematicians, an economist, a lawyer, a behavioral psychologist, you know, maybe an artist, um, I don't know, just a group, we could crack the code. And the physicists were like, great, great idea. Let's put it together. Let's make a proposal. Let's get the funding. They love that. But you would go to an economist and say, well, would you like to join this team? They would say, well, you have nothing to teach us. Why Why would we want to work with physicists? I mean, what does that have to do with economics? So interestingly, the biggest impediment to improving economic science were the economists themselves because they're so drenched, uh, uh, marinated, I guess, in their own models, most of which are mistaken, that they can't see the way forward. So I got a lot out of that. I just started doing it myself, building my own models and working with teams. I've started companies that, that do that now. So um, I've had a lot of success with it. 